I got fired today. Can you believe that? Five years pulling tape off of cardboard boxes only, only for the wimpy receptionist to be telling me to pack my bags. God, that damn receptionist. He's, he's one of those people that everyone likes and for no reason. <laughs> if anything, he's, he's overly nice. Everything he says is just so kind and nice. And, oh, well, you couldn't just possibly fault him. Oh, it is. It's pathetic. So there I am, after a long day pulling tape off of cardboard boxes, and I go to him to clock, day, clock eight. And, you know, instead of, oh, hi, Maria. I noticed you're wearing your hair down. It looks lovely, by the way. No, I'm greeted with, <laughs> What's your name? So I tell this guy my name and then he spends like 20 minutes searching me up on his little computer thing. And he's one of those people that types at like 500 decibels and, and like with all this click clacking on the keyboard, I cannot even hear myself think. And then eventually he gets all kind and slow talking and condescending really. And he says, oh, I'm so sorry. It appears that you've been fired because, well, oh, you see, unfortunately, there's just been budget cuts. And oh, gosh, it seems that the box department is the first to be let go. <laughs> and then, OK, then this guy turns and offers me a hot drink and a pastry to help me with my troubles. So. I made an astute comment about how all this guy does is hog the newspaper to do his stupid little crosswords every day. And then, oh, he got all apologetic. And he, Christ even offered me the newspaper. You know, that guy is the most popular guy in that office. And he didn't even remember my name. So I brought that up with him again, you know to make him feel bad. He made up some sob story about how he's afraid of me. Me? Yeah, apparently on his first day, he came up and asked my name. And so I said, mind your own business. And I don't know, I don't know why anyone would be afraid of that, but. Anyway, it doesn't matter because I got the final word in with this dickhead. Oh, no, really. I called him a wet wipe. And I told him that I hope that this shit-faced company treats him better than it treated me. Have to admit, that one did actually sound better in the moment. Um, anyway, I don't need this job, okay? Well, well, I do. But I've been so focused on my career for the last few years. I haven't really had much time to socialise. So, you know, I have a few savings tied me over. I'll be okay. And... Without this stupid job holding me back, I don't have the chance to pursue what I really want. To write. Okay, look, I'm 23, I'm sexy, I'm incredibly intelligent. Honestly, I, I think there's a bestseller in me. So when I heard I had to leave this shitty job, I just saw it as a big opportunity and started thinking about all the possible book ideas. And I was really excited, okay? They could do, you know, drama or murder mystery, romance, self-help. Cause think about it, like holding down a job in the boxing department for what, five years? I think that qualifies me to give out some self-help advice. And so on my way home from work then, well, X work okay it, it hit me it really hit me I had my notebook and my pen because well I've had them in my tote bag for years I've just never really had a reason to use them until until today because today I decided to write down inspiration as it struck and like as if by fate I see this dad and his kid and She's just a little girl, maybe three, and they're running around in the park together playing tag, okay? And her laugh, her laugh, it was like music. Really, really bad music. Like think about the worst song that you know, okay? And then picture it being played by a group of gross, 
creepy best and 14 year old boys who were like, oh dude, let's start a band for the school talent. Oh yeah, dude. And like, they just have no chance of winning this talent show. And someone needs to remind them of that. Anyway, um, yeah, so I take it out and I wrote down annoying ass kid because I could write a book about someone like her and give her, okay, this like miraculous character development where she learns, she learns not to be annoying as hell in public. And then, okay, I saw this little old lady preaching and she had this audience of like 15 people all while she's shouting stuff like, God's story isn't finished. God's story will, must be told. And then, then it hit me. It's the Bible. No, it literally, she literally threw it in my face and like knocked me clean out. So I jump up. Right, ready to throw hands at this little old lady, but no one was even looking at me. Nobody even noticed. So I was like, okay, maybe I won't start to fight um, a geriatric in in public. So instead, I go over and I pick up, I pick up the Bible, and then I leave. And as I'm walking home, I'm looking at the title of this God book, and I'm reading it again and again. And then I feel an idea start to form. Like, so many people are obsessed with this book, right? And I just need to write something like that. Like, I mean, how hard can that be? Especially now that I don't have that shitty job holding me back. And so it gets me thinking about the Bible and like how old it is. Cause it must be what, 500 years old, like at least, right? And it's just, it's helped so many people. And more importantly, okay, it has this crazy dedicated fan base. They, they, they go insane for it, right? I think, no, I know the world is ready for a sequel. So I run home, open up the Word document. I'm ready to get started right away. Only I notice it's, it's actually a bit harder than I thought it would be. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't actually read the first book. So I decided to give the first chapter a go. And you know what? It's actually really cool. It's all about how the world started and everything. Actually, I think I'm gonna have to up my game a little bit if I wanna live up to the first installment in the series. It's not really a series, is it? It's kind of just one book. Or is it like loads of little books? Am, am I writing the first sequel or am I writing like the 80th sequel? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to do some research on that. I actually, there's actually a lot of research I have to do, but I don't care because this, this book that I'm writing, it will make me a legend. And I don't care how much Googling it takes to get me there. Look, I know what you're thinking, but I'm actually a really good writer. Look, I'm not one of these nut jobs who thinks I'm Jane Austen reborn or anything. No, I'm actually more of a Charlotte Bronte. Probably, I haven't read any of his books, but I have won a writing competition. Yeah, the whole school entered and I won. <laughs> it was amazing. All eyes were on me as I was reading my award-winning short story. You know, I think some kid even cried because it was just so beautiful. And ever since then, I've known I have the power to change the world with my words. I'm going to be the next big thing. Just you watch. I want a writing competition today. Mrs. Burgess called out my name at the assembly. Everyone turned to look at me and I didn't know what to do. <sighs> Mrs. Berger started calling me up on the stage. Why is it so hard to walk when a bunch of kids are staring at you? When I got up there, I could finally see what Mrs. Berger saw. Everyone was looking up at me. Well, almost. A load of kids were looking at their phones and some girls were doing each other's hair. I wish someone did my hair. Mrs. Burgess made everyone clap for me. 
I'd acted in moments like this before in my bedroom. I'd stand on my bed and look out at the crowd as they cheered me on. Except the crowd was my desk and my littlest pet shops. Even my littlest pet shops didn't look that interested in me. I was thinking about them and that's why I didn't realise Mrs. Burgers was telling me I was going to read out my story. She handed me the printed out story and I had no idea what it was, even though it was obvious. It felt like it took forever to figure that out. Mrs. Burgers then took me over to a microphone on the stand and before I could even think about what I was doing, I started to read. By half a page, my throat was dry. By a full page, I was coughing. I couldn't see myself, but I say my face went from red to purple to white and my eyes were popping out of my head. A bunch of lads started laughing, but a teacher got mad at them and told them that they were being held back and break. By the time I finished coughing, I had lost my place on the page. At this point, tears were welling up in my eyes. From the coughing, obviously. I heard a girl ask, is she crying? And her friends laughed. I wasn't embarrassed. I was furious. I gave up looking for my place on the page and then I puked all over the stage. On purpose. It was the coolest thing I ever did. I felt like a punk rocker. Mrs. I even think I heard a kid start to cry. Mrs. Bur Burgers very quickly put an end to the assembly and had Miss Stanley take me to a classroom to have a glass of water or whatever. <laughs> I'm on a high ride now. <sighs> Mom was not happy when I told her about it though. She didn't even know I got sick on purpose. She thought I was legitimately ill and she was still mad. She, I told her I was lucky I wasn't sent home because then she would have had to leave work early to pick me up. She didn't appreciate the silver lining. She said it was incredibly rude of me to get sick in front of so many people and that she was mortified. She then got suspicious of what I might be eating in the school canteen. And then I said she can start packing me a lunch then and that shut her up. I decided not to tell her I got my sick made a kid cry, even though that was the thing I was most proud of. Mum didn't even care I won the competition. She thinks that writing is a dead art, but that's because she's not smart enough to read anything other than books on mindfulness meditation. I suppose if I should write a self-help book. I suppose if I were to I should have a good life. Maybe be successful at something. I read some of Mum's books and that author didn't seem very successful. Like, what successful person would have their book in a charity shop that Mum got for 6 50 cents in Oxfam? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe good books end up in charity shops because people love them so much that they just want to share their joy. I called dad earlier tonight and told him all about today, but he can only talk for half an hour because he had a business meeting after. <sighs> Time difference problems. He seemed to be proud of me for winning the writing competition and even seemed slightly amused by my puke story. I'm not sure though. I don't think he was fully paying attention Every time I talk to him, it's like he has the appropriate response, but he's not engaging in the same conversation that I am. His consciousness is off somewhere else. This isn't just when he's working abroad. He's always been like this. I know this is horrible because people my age don't even have dads that they can talk to, but it feels like I don't even have a dad. I wish I didn't say that. At least dad doesn't shout at me like mom does whenever I do cool things like puke on stage and make a kid cry. After the call, I played with my littlest pet shops. And this should be embarrassing because I am 13, but I'm not embarrassed. 
they're tools for my writing. I like to set them up dramatic scenarios and act them out using the little dogs, pigs and turtles and such. I never write them down though, so maybe they're not tools for my writings and I'm just childish. Obviously I don't tell anyone at school that I play with them. Not play, write. I write with them. The reason I don't tell them is because they're not creatives. They wouldn't understand. It's not because I'm embarrassed. Today, the pig family had some family drama. One of the pig sisters was caught having an affair with the St. Bernard. He is the town hunk. It got very heated. I think I'm gonna kill off one of the pig sisters soon and have her come back from the dead as some sort of big plot twist. That would be genius. This Bible 2 business is way more complicated than I thought it would be. You know, it actually started out great. I even got an interview with a publishing group and that was amazing. You know, it's funny really, actually. It's funny what I can get people to do for me when I pretend to be all sappy and nice, like that damn receptionist. Anyway, the publisher's name is Roberta and she is so cool. She was really nice, but not in like a gross, sicky kind of way. No, she was nice in a way that told me that she respected me, but that she would drop that respect really quickly if I started acting up. She wasn't that keen on my idea though, which I found strange because, hello, Roberta, I am literally writing the sequel to the world's most popular book ever. Apart from maybe something like, I don't know, Harry Potter or Obama's autobiography. That was, that was great. Anyway, she thinks that this Bible thing mightn't go down well with certain groups and that I'd be psychologically evaluated if I started claiming to be God or Jesus. But I told her, Roberta, that is not what I'm doing here. And she gave me this weird look and her like, eyebrows raised and she was like, really, is that not what you're doing? She did tell me something though that gave me like a little bit of a glimmer of hope. Yeah, she, she said that if I care enough about what I'm writing, then somebody out there will care enough to read it that my passion will leap up off of the page and hook a reader in. And then their, my passion, it'll become their passion. <sighs> How cool is that? Honestly, I think I might take that for my book. In the end, she said that if I did up a first draft and sent it on over to her, she'd read it. Oh, can you imagine that? This big, important, intelligent woman wants to read my work. This is only the beginning. After after that meeting though, things kind of took a bit of a weird turn. Um, I was like I, maybe 10 pages into my first draft and I got this letter and it came in this like big black ominous kind of looking envelope thing. By the way, black is a terrible color for an envelope, but anyway. It came with all this complicated legal talk, but. I got the gist. I've been watching Judge Judy a lot now that I'm unemployed. Although I'm not really unemployed. I'm actually a full-time writer. Anyway, I knew what this letter was saying and it had it up the top as well. Cease and desist. Basically, I have to stop writing my Bible or else God himself was going to sue me. I can't make this shit up. At first I assume maybe Roberta has told somebody about my plan and they've sent it to me as this joke. Maybe even Roberta herself had sent it to me, but come on, then I thought, Roberta, she is way too cool for fake cease and desist letters. And quite frankly, so am I. So I just threw it away. But I, I didn't get away that easy. Um, a few days later, I was up on the rooftop and I was watering my fern and I got this smell of smoke and burning. So straight away, I'm imagining all the worst case scenarios. 
my building is on fire and I'm trapped up on the roof. I'm going to have to jump from the roof onto one of those weird, gross fireman trampoline thingies. And that is so embarrassing. I was up there and I was like, honestly, you know, I'd actually rather die. So, but <laughs> my building wasn't on fire. Um, no, it was just like one of the shrubs that lined the rooftop. Yeah, a burning bush. Honestly, I actually had to laugh before I realized a shrub had spontaneously combusted right in front of me. So I'm not going down to go get a fire extinguisher when I hear this weird voice. And the voice is coming from the bush. It starts to literally word for word recite my cease and desist letter that I'd received. And I'm just standing there gobsmacked and then it stops and the bush just puts itself out. Look, okay, I, I know I sound like a nut job, but honestly, okay, this, this will all start to make sense. Kind of, I guess. Um, look, I just decided to ignore it because honestly, I didn't really see this whole burning bush thing as a bit as a threat, really. Because like, the bush put itself out, right? So, you know. So I went in, I finished up a couple more pages of my book before bed. But then that night, I was awoken because there was this blinding light in my eyes. So instinctively, I just, I told the light to go fuck itself. And then I kind of started to wake up and become a little bit more lucid. And I realized that there was a person just standing in my room. And not just that, that, that the light was coming from this person, this, this angel, really. Um, and before I can even break out my fighting moves, it starts to talk. And I will give you one guess what it started to say. Yeah, that damn cease and desist letter. So like at this point, I'm convinced that I'm in a dream. So I just roll on over and that stupid letter, I just know it is burned into the back of my subconscious. Anyway, I decided to ignore all of this because ugh, what else am I supposed to do? Believe I'm being sued and by God? <laughs> So I can continue on and at this point I'm maybe like halfway through chapter two and I, I hear this knock at my door which that's that's strange because um well nobody nobody comes to visit me so anyway so I'm walking down there and I'm like oh my god what if it's what if it's the old guy from up, upstairs okay like I can't talk to the elderly just last week I was ready to fight a little old lady so I'm walking in there and I open the door and it's not the old man, so thank God. Uh, no, it's this young man and he's in this suit and tie and I've never seen him before. I don't know if this is a bit obvious, um, but sometimes I can say things without speaking. And th this was one of those times because I greeted him and I was like, who the hell are you? Did the old man die? Did you move in? really I really instantly regretted that because like what if what if the old man did die okay and this this is like his son or something but it wasn't so that's all good uh no uh he told me that he was a lawyer and not just any old lawyer no he told me he was a heaven lawyer so, so th this this is bad okay uh but I invite him in which I again instantly instant regret uh, because he told me that God is pressing charges on me for breaking some copyright rules with his book. I told him, I, I got real mad. I told I was like, you cannot do this because the book is old as hell, right? Oh, sorry about the poor choice of words there on that one. Um, and then he turns to me and he's all like, uh, he's all like, um, oh, I can do, God can do whatever he wants because he's God. And I was like, oh, just cut the bullshit. Okay, tell me what I have to do. And that is how I found out that I am actually up in court in three weeks. Three, three weeks. Uh, yeah, apparently there's no way for me to win this. So there's no point in giving any over any more time for me to come up with a good defense. <laughs> how unfair. God, and now, so on top of everything I have to do for this, this book, okay, now I have to learn law and and not from Judge Judy, this is going to seriously cut into my writing time. 
Look, all I know, okay, is that I have never lost an argument, ever. So God, God has a big storm coming. Today, we had drama class in school. I disagree with the concept of drama classes because we're in school to learn, not to mess around or be trees or whatever. It's not that I'm bad at it or anything. I don't want to brag, but I'm a good actor. Mrs. Stanley made us make angry faces, so I scrunched up my face as much as possible to make myself look furious. It wasn't hard, because a lot of things infuriate me. <laughs> Mrs. Stanley said I did such a good job that she used me as an example for a good angry face. She said it's because I scrunched up all the muscles in my face and that's why it looked so good. <laughs> this girl, Sarah, was all like, that's not fair, she always looks like that. I think she was just jealous because her angry face was just pathetic. It's like she's so afraid of looking bad that she barely even tried. I know I seem like the quiet one in class, but people like Sarah are so much more insecure than me because at least I'm not afraid to pull an angry face. I guess Sarah just cares so much because she's friends to lose. After we did angry faces, we did an improv exercise and Miss, we had to get into groups of fours and Miss Stanley had to put me into a group because no one picked me for theirs, as always. We had to improvise a story set in a classroom and someone, one of us played a teacher that had a secret to hide. I played one of the students in the classroom and I just sat there because I couldn't think of anything funny to say. No one else thought of anything funny to say, but <laughs> that didn't stop them from talking. While I was pretending to be a student in this classroom, I realised life is like an improv class where everyone else knows the prompt but me. And I always say the wrong thing. It's unfair. People think I'm rude all the time, but it's not my fault I don't know the prompt. Lunch started off the same as always. I sat in a corridor by myself and wrote a story in my head. Mum calls this maladaptive daydreaming. She says if it continues to interfere with my social and academic life, I'll have to go to the doctor. In my opinion, it doesn't matter that it interferes with my life because I want to be a writer. So technically, I'm practicing a skill that is important to my career. In my story, I imagined a family with like eight kids. In real life, I wish I had a sibling because then I'd always have a friend. Siblings have to be your friend because you see them all the time. In my imaginary story, I made life hard for the kids and they got no privacy and the older ones had to take care of the younger ones. I was thinking of a name for the fourth kid when I was interrupted by someone going, "Oh, you all by yourself. It was Sarah. She sat down next to me in everything. I told her I don't mind being by myself and she sounded all sympathetic and started asking me what subjects I'm taking and if I liked them. It was like there was a, a glitch in the matrix. <sighs> like, she, she, it sounded like she was being all nice to me, but I didn't think she was being nice. Her tone didn't match her intention. It was kind of awkward in responding to her. It's like her presence activates my fight or flight. It's not because I'm shy or awkward. It's just, I'm good at picking up on people's bad vibes. Sarah had the worst vibes. She spoke to me for like 20 minutes and I wonder if her friends were in detention or something and that's why she resorted to t talking to me. Maybe she felt bad for earlier when she said, I look angry all the time. I don't know. I was relieved when the bell rang. On the way home, Mam was all upbeat and peppy. At first I thought it was because Jamie Oliver released a new cookbook, but then she told me she booked a trip to New York to see Dad during the Easter break. I won't lie, I am excited. I've only ever seen New York in stuff like Rent or in The Devil Wears Prada. I wonder if it's like that in, in real life, like it is in the films. I can't wait to see Dad too, of course. 
it's a lot easier to talk to him over a dinner table than over a video call. It'll do him good to remind him he has a daughter. Dad, maybe he'll keep me over there. And I'll go to an American school. And I'll get an American boyfriend. Irish, American people love Irish people, so I think I'll be pretty popular. We'd eat Twinkies and wear our own clothes to school. Maybe I'd become a cheerleader and wear one of those costumes. And all the boys would gawk at me and my American boyfriend would tell them to F off. I'm maladaptive, daydreaming again. Maybe it isn't so good for my career. If I actually wrote down my stories, I'd probably be better at writer than if I just act them out in my head. I don't want to write them down. When I write my stories down, it means I have to read them and correct the bad parts. This might not seem obvious, but I'm hypercritical of myself. Mam says I'm hypercritical of others, but I think that's okay because I judge myself just as much as I judge others. I mean, like, yeah, I think everyone's a dickhead because I'm a dickhead too. Well, that's not completely true. I act like a dickhead sometimes, but I'm not a dickhead because I have a good reason to act rude. The people in New York will probably be dickheads. <laughs> I can't wait to meet them. You know, this whole being sued by God thing, it's not really as bad as I expected. When the le heaven lawyer left, I went straight to a British because I was having some serious doubts about this whole situation. Like, is all of this really worth it for a book? <laughs> she basically told me straight away to just stop writing immediately because apparently the firm have been caught up in copyright situations like this before and no, no, it is not worth it. So as a friend, she advised. Okay, but she might not have used the term friend, but I know what she was thinking it. Okay. Anyway, she advised me to just give up on it. But that that was when her assistant, Ron, Ronnie, I think. Anyway, he came in to deliver off paperwork or something. I, I don't know what assistants do. Um, and he recognized me and not just from my last time in, he recognized me from the news. Apparently, the story leaked and the press, they are eating this shit up because this is like the first heaven earth crossover trial in centuries. So the news just broke about me writing the Bible too. And there is literally hundreds of editors trying to get my contact information. So this is when Roberta, she went all authoritative and she was like, I'm not letting this get away from me. Maria, you will publish that book and you will publish it with us. Honestly, I don't blame the woman. Like with all this press attention, me and my book, gold mine so I vowed to get my first draft finished and I practically skipped home to write it I, I did still technically have that minor issue of still being sued by God to deal with um yeah so I show up to court I show up to court with nothing not, not even a defense and I know you're thinking oh my god you're an idiot but hear me out okay I was just gonna rely on my own natural charm to get me through this because as I've mentioned, I don't have a filter, but that lack of filter, it tends to lead to just some of the most intelligent and inspirational speeching, speeches that I've ever heard, sometimes. Anyway, I get to this court and God's there with his heaven lawyer and look, Someone's got to say it. God? Not that much to look at. But I suppose you don't have to be, you know, when you're God. <laughs> like, you don't need to prove to anyone that you're class because you just are. Anyway, the court itself, oh my God, so boring. Like, the judge was just going on and on with all this, like, legal drabble, kind of. But there was this juror so I wasn't paying attention because this juror, okay, he was, he was kind of good looking and staring at him was taking up most of my attention span anyway, but that, it didn't matter because 
You got maybe like an hour into court when a juror stands up. The hot juror that I was staring at. He stands up and he's all like, um, God paid us. Uh, yeah, God paid us to deliver a guilty verdict. Anyway, God not having it. Okay, he jumps up and he's like, How dare you betray me? How dare you betray me, Judas? Judas. The guy's name was Judas. Like, what parents hate their kids so much? That, oh, oh, I just got that. Judas, 12 men, loyal to God. Oh, that actually kind of makes sense. They all had it for a meal after as well. Anyway, anyway, none of that matters because, thank God, the case was dropped. And here is the juicy bit. God, he has to do community service for rigging the jury. <laughs> oh my God. I guess you can't really put him in a jail. I think. I don't know. I haven't actually read the whole Bible yet. It's long and everyone goes on about how their favorite character is jesus and jesus is the main guy but like i'm halfway through and he hasn't even shown up yet so i don't really know what he's gonna be up to but we'll see we'll see no spoilers you know anyway as i was leaving the courthouse i saw god sitting by himself which was a little bit sus to me because you'd think god would have you know a bunch of friends but no he was there by himself and i don't know I walked up to him because he just he looked so lonely. Okay, no, that was a lie. I walked up to him because I thought maybe I could get some writing tips off this guy, you know? Anyway, he explained to me that he couldn't get back up to heaven because they were doing like renovations, which that was a bit strange to me because I remember when we got renovations in the house when I was a kid and like they just sealed off a part of the house and we just like lived in the rest of it, you know? Anyway, I decided not to question it because oh, it's God. And, you know, I want God to like me. And I want God to give me writing tips. Anyway, anyway, I did something then that I, I never thought I'd do. I, I helped someone less fortunate. I offered God a place to stay with me while, you know, the renovations were happening up there, you know. Oh God, I hope I'm not turning into a real softy. First, I'm helping the homeless. Next, I'll be like recycling. Oh, I just, I don't want to go all Mother Teresa on this, you know? But look, I, I saw it as an opportunity, a blessing in disguise, you know? Because who better to write a sequel to a book than the guy who wrote the original? And like, let's face it he owes me he's living with me okay he has to help me and you know especially with the whole copyright thing like that was just thrown in the gutter so you know he you know he owes me i hope he likes soy milk <laughs> what am i saying i don't care he's living with me he'll drink what he's given look okay when i make it as this famous writer okay that's that's it for me i'm gonna be a legend Okay, I will be the writer I have always wanted to be. I wonder what Conan have me on his show. Okay, note to self. You need to come up with like a funny, memorable childhood anecdote, you know, to tell Conan. <laughs> Mom and I got into a huge fight on our way to New York. We got to order our food and she made me choose the vegetarian option because she says I need to lose weight. She says I have puppy fat. I think that means I'm awkward and that I either can't fit into children's clothes or adult clothes, but there's nothing I can do about that. New York is unreal. I wanted to be an actor there, but then I watched this Louis Thoreau documentary on off-Broadway actors and it's way too hard. At first, I thought it was because the actors weren't trying hard enough, but to be honest, they were talented and they still weren't getting paid any money. Maybe I'll be a model in New York instead.
Dinner with Dad was great. He let me order the pulled pork sandwich, even though Mom said I was on a diet. I told him about my life and he listened to me for once. He seemed genuinely excited when I told him I won the short story award. He definitely forgot I told him on video chat, but it was okay. I didn't see him for the rest of the holiday. I was upset and mom told me to cop on and be grateful that we were on this once in a lifetime trip. I said I fully intend to come back here as a model so it wouldn't be once in a lifetime and Jida said I wouldn't be a model while I was still eating pulled pork sandwiches for dinner. She's looking at him thick skinned girls that have a serious problem with that. I got to go to Central Park. I put on my best hoodie and jeggings and I hoped I'd be photographed by that Humans of New York guy. You know, the guy that takes photos of randos on the street and puts them on his Facebook page? It has like a million likes and it'd be an easy way into the modelling industry if I got on there. Me and mom stayed in the park for like two hours before I checked my Facebook and I saw he was in Calcutta and was taking photos of people over there. Why would he call it Humans of New York if he's taking photos of people out in Calcutta? <sighs> Mom and I got into a fire last night in New York. We met this old couple from Texas in our hotel lobby. The old lady asked if I liked school and I said I dread going back to those bastards. I used that phrasing too because it's true and because I thought I was being funny. Obviously, mum was upset that I used the word bastards in front of a 67 year old lady and I had to defend myself and say I was only being honest and that it wasn't even that bad of a word. In my opinion, I can say whatever I want in a foreign country because it's not like I'm going to ever meet any of these people again. Like, why would I care what an old lady from Texas thinks of me? Our argument evolved into me crying about how everyone at school either hates me or is frightened of me. It was pathetic. Mom thought so too. And she said so to me. Many times. She said that maybe if I stuck to my vegetarian meal plan and stopped calling people bastards, that maybe I'd have more friends. I said to her that maybe if she said, read a self-help book that scientists hadn't denounced, that maybe she wouldn't have so many anger issues and so many attempts at giving me an eating disorder. It got wild. Back to school soon. I can't wait until I'm older so I don't have to deal with all this stuff. <laughs> Whatever adulthood is, it can't be as bad as this. God didn't like the first draft of my book. You know how they say that you're your own harshest critic? Yeah, well, believe me, God was way harsher than I am, so. He did promise though that um, he'd help me with the second draft and I pretended to act all aloof and like I didn't care but honestly I was, I'm pretty excited. This guy is meant to be such a good writer. <laughs> He's supposed to coach this child's football team as part of his community service. I go along to some of the training sessions you know to get some inspiration um, to be out in the fresh air never helps though whoever came up with this idea that nature is all inspirational and stuff yeah first class bullshitter the kids are cool though and they all go to god with their problems i guess it's because he's just such a good listener like the other day he helped this kid in his school bully and <laughs> god told me that he only gave the guy a few words of encouragement but honestly this kid grew by three inches between matches 
I should ask God if he could make me grow. Look, I've always thought, okay, if I was a few inches taller, I would be an amazing model. Ooh, model and a writer. Now that, that's a dream come true. Oh, and I could write this really touching um, memoir where I discuss the crushing pressures of the beauty industry on women. And of course, about how I'm besties, you know, with the Hadid sisters. Okay, I'm not actually besties with the Hadid sisters, but I could be. Okay, if I was this model slash writer, I could be. And God's actually an okay person to live with. I've never had a flatmate or grew up with siblings or anything, so I've never had to share my space. And I haven't actually mentioned this before, but um, I, I don't have a bed. Um, no, I sleep on like a collection of things and I know what you're thinking it I know it sounds crazy and that like I live in dire poverty but it's not that it's I prefer it yeah um it's more comfortable I noticed the day after I moved in here because I was just so tired from moving that I just kind of like collapsed <laughs> where I was standing and I know something about the cold hard ground it was actually really nice on my back and God didn't like judge me or anything for that when he came in and saw it he just was like Oh, it is like a nest. That was that. <clears throat> there are drawbacks to living with him though. And you know, like he just hogs the shower for hours every morning doing God knows what, but to be fair, he does kind of make up for it. He makes the most perfect stack of pancakes I've ever seen. I don't know how he does it. It is the perfect ratio of pancake to syrup to strawberry. I'm pretty good. And then one night I was making a joke. I was like, oh, you know, I really could do with some wine. <laughs> why don't you, why don't you turn on the tap? It's a water into wine joke. Yeah, well, okay, he didn't laugh. Uh, I actually kind of thought I offended him, which would be a really stupid joke to get offended over by the way, God, but anyway. I don't think I did because he went out for a while and then he came back with like three bottles of Merlot. Not from the tap, which would have been quicker, but anyway. So that night, myself and God, we decided to have a wine night. Yeah, uh, come up, brainstorm, you know, chat about the book. But after a few drinks, I don't know, I just started oversharing all my thoughts on the world. I asked God, why are we so lonely? You know, when we pass people on the street every day who could be our best friend, we can't go up to them. You know, because there's all these social barriers that serve no greater purpose only to make adults like myself feel awkward and uncomfortable when making friends. And God answered my question and many, many more of my thoughts on society and things, but I saw that night's Bishop Blair, so no, I actually remember them. You know, if I'd had like three or four less glasses of wine, I'd, I'd probably have the answer to what life's all about. <laughs> anyway, I had a meeting with Roberta this week. Uh, boring, booky stuff. Oh, God, you know, I actually just wish I could just skip this whole admin side of things, all the like accounting and stuff and just get on to my acceptance speech at the Oscars. Yeah, I know. Oscars are for movies, not for books. But, well, I'm planning on having best screenplay, best adapted screenplay or whatever under my belt once I get all this sorted. Anyway, as I was leaving Roberta's office, her assistant, this, this Ronnie guy, he came up to me and he was really nervous, which confused me because I've been on like my best behavior, okay? I know this guy could get Roberta to drop this book deal in an instant, okay? So I haven't been taking any chances. It's not like I've been acting like myself around him. God, no. Thankfully, though, he wasn't nervous because I scare him or anything. No. Um, he actually told me that he liked me. Yeah. He said that the last draft of the book was amazing. And I I giggled. I, like, stood there. I was like, mm -hmm, thanks. Which completely weirded me out, okay? Because I wanted to say, ha, 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 I know. Ronnie, I'm a genius. I always say overconfident things like that. I guess it's like to make myself seem more confident. 
or to make people think I'm joking. Although actually, now I think I am quite confident. But people still think I'm joking when I start bragging about myself like that. Anyway, then Ronnie asked me for dinner. So I I straight away started thinking of something to make fun of him about because that's just like my natural reflex in this situation. Um, but I decided not to bully him about, oh my God, he like tucks his shirt into his trousers and it looks ridiculous, okay? Very few people with of his structure can pull that off and he's not, he's not one of them. Um, but I didn't. Instead, I said, sure okay that sounds fun and then i left that building as quickly as i could um and i felt a little bit like a sap for not making fun of him you know but then i don't know another part of me felt like confident and sexy and cool for not ruining this guy's day and i just thought you know what's to lose ronnie he seems he seems harmless and I know harmless can tend to be code for an idiot. Um, which, you know, I'm sure he's still out. But I just thought maybe he'd surprise me. Okay, maybe maybe he'd even be as, as, as intelligent as I am. And I was totally right, of course. Because uh, we went out for dinner that Friday. <sighs> he's just so sound. And like, he kept asking all these questions about me and my life and how I felt knowing that I'm going to be Ireland's next big author. I realised something as I was talking to him. I love talking about myself. And honestly, I think Ronnie enjoys me talking about myself as much as I enjoy doing it. So it's kind of win-win. But like, he was just this great listener. And he was so funny and... Okay, look, it's not like I like the guy. Okay, I don't fancy him. Maybe I could see myself going out bowling with him as buddies, okay? Like, it, it, we'd have fun. We could go to the arcade. Play some, play some games, some dancing ones, or the ones where you're like pretending to drive a car. I, oh, and I'd like crash my car into his car in the game, and he'd be like, oh, you bitch! And no, well, Ronnie wouldn't, wouldn't actually call me a bitch, and I'd be like, oh, you bastard! Because eh, I'd probably most definitely call him a bastard. Oh my god, am I thinking too much into this? I can tend to do that. Oh, okay, maybe I'm jumping the gun here. Maybe, maybe he hated hanging out with me. And he never wants to see me again because... <sighs> I did slip up a little bit while we were having dinner. I told him to stop with the stupid shirt tucking into the trousers thing. I couldn't help it. It looks so bad. But he didn't even seem offended by it. Actually, he told me that he should keep me around to give him the fashion advice that he so clearly needs. What if, what if he was like secretly offended? Oh my God, oh my God, if he's telling Roberta how to ruin my career, like as as we speak. Oh my God, I just I just hope I'm wrong on that. Oh God. Oh, and speaking of God, we also had a bit of a run in this week and it, and it may have been kind of totally my fault. And for me to even admit that, that's so hard for me. So I just, I know it was bad. You see, I was meant to go to his team's semi-final match, um, but I didn't. Oops. <laughs> um, but you see, okay, that was the night I was out with Ronnie. So I said I'd make it up to him. And on Sunday, I'd go and take pictures for their training. I also missed that. They were playing, they were playing this like once-off showing of a film, okay, up in this like small, arty, kind of independent little movie theatre um up in town and I couldn't miss that because I'm sure I've mentioned I'm actually quite cultured like that like I just might like that a bit anyway I think God needs to be more understanding okay I need to experience this experimentive and um rich films like the like this one because they they provide me with deep inspiration I left this theatre feeling like an auteur Anyway, God, he, he like took his time being mad about it, but then he kind of just let it go, which is weird. Like, can you imagine that? Just like, I don't know, because like usually when I do something like that and well, people just kind of tend to drop me straight away. 
Um, well, it's actually only happened once, but anyway. Um, but no, one day I came down and he was just kind of like making his perfect pancakes. And he was like, I forgive you. I personally expected him to be like packing his bags and heading off to some gross hostel, but no, he forgave me. I don't know people had the option to forgive me. Um, but I did vow to never piss him off again because I, I just don't want to end up on his bad side. I need to do a serious overhaul of my life. <laughs> I thought I was doing really well. <laughs> well, like, not really. Fight with mum all the time, dad doesn't know my age and I don't have any friends. Didn't have any friends. I thought I was a good person. And now I'm realising maybe I'm not. Like, I thought everyone was delusional for not liking me. And now I'm thinking that maybe I'm a small part of the issue. Maybe. Not to be dramatic, but today changed everything. I was doing a presentation on South Africa in school. This is so boring. Why am I telling you this? Okay, whatever, I'll just say it. The presentation was just boring as hell. I Charlize Theron, Elon Musk, Nelson, 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 Mandela. The Mandela effect, however, that's something I can speak on with much enthusiasm. Like, I can't believe we have definite proof that multiple parallel universes exist. And yet the only people that talk about them are people that make YouTube videos. Like, oh. Miss Brusco burst in, in the middle of my presentation. She was frantic, her keys all over the shop. Why does she always hold keys? She called me out of the classroom and the first thought that enters my head is that the news wants to talk to me about my story. I'm not even joking, that's where my mind went. I don't know why. Because nine times out of ten, when anyone pays any attention to me, it's to make fun of me or to make me apologise for something. The attention wasn't positive. RTE wasn't there to ask me about my pros, uh, not even version me doing one. Um, Miss Brusco sat me down and dropped the bombshell that one of the teachers read my story and realised it was an exact copy of this big shot author's story from 20 years ago. It was in his short story collection. I didn't even realise the teachers at my school could read. <laughs> Now is not the time for jokes. Um, sorry. I didn't lie to Miss Brusco. I copied my story word for word from a book I found in the school library. It wasn't even that good, which is why I thought I could pass it off as a 13 year old's work. Also, I never thought anyone would choose to read it, which is why I thought I would never get caught. Maybe if I had entered my own writing into the competition, I would have still won. Miss Brusco asked me why. Why would I bother copying someone's work? I said I didn't know, which is kind of true. I think I'm 
a great writer. I think if I entered my own work into the competition, I still would have had a chance to win. I just... <sighs> panicked and submitted something else. I'm explaining myself again. I did a bad thing, a very bad thing. But I still don't think that makes it fair that Miss Brusco brought me back into class and publicly humiliated me in front of everyone. Like, I know I'm in the wrong here, but like that has to constitute as child abuse or something. It was a dick move. My classmates and Mrs. Stanley looked at me so disappointedly, which is so confusing because their standards for me are already so low that disappointing them is so difficult. At lunch, some lads called me a plagiarising ass bitch, <laughs> which, which is fair. I don't know if they really cared that much since uh, lads don't generally care about competition integrity. Well, I think they just watch me like a hawk and pounce whenever I fuck up. Happens a lot. I'm giving myself a victim complex, am I? Be a better person, Maria. It's not that hard. I'm not a victim. Everyone ignores me and I thought I was supposed to go through all this stuff so that when I'm older, I can look back and be inspired by my past. I'm now realizing that's not the case and maybe I'm just a dick. At lunch, this girl, Georgie, sat down next to me. I don't really know her that well, but I've seen her around and she's so cool. Like, she's one of those types that expresses herself as much as she can, even though she has to wear the school uniform. Like, she <laughs> brings in a tote bag to school, which is so impractical, but it makes her look like a cool hippie chick. She said that she thought the story I plagiarised was bad and that I should have chose a better one. At first, I thought she was just being mean to me. But then she laughed. In a nice way and not a mean way. <laughs> she said that she thought it was so hilarious that I plagiarised this story from this big shot author guy from 20 years ago and I was sticking it to the man by entering it into a school writing competition where I didn't even win money as a prize. <laughs> it was from that moment that I thought that me and Georgie could be best friends. She invited me to hang out and never really hung out with someone before so I said that we should go bowling because if we ever run out of anything to talk about well we can just talk about how the bowling's going. She's gonna invite some of her hippie friends from her youth club. Is this my first friend group? I always see those packet of friendship bracelets in Claire's and think what's it like to have four friends? What's it like to have one friend? Maybe Georgie's friends will buy bracelets with me. At lunch I noticed something. I didn't tell Georgie to leave me alone or that her presentation on Belarus was shockingly shite. 
I kept my mouth shut and it actually worked out. Like, don't get me wrong. I am keeping an eye on this girl. Like, I'm not suspicious of her per se, but like, what if she just turns around and is all just like, you foolish mortal, you fell for a master plan. Could you really believe I wanted to befriend you? The whole school is on it. It's all a ruse. Oh. <laughs> oh. I'm giving up the victim complex. I'm giving up the plagiarism. I'm giving up pushing away everyone every chance I get. I'm changing. I did it. I finished the final draft of the book and God, God loved it. He actually called it a masterpiece, but. We had a party then afterwards to finish the writing of the book and it was small enough. There was God, Ronnie, me, Roberta, and we all did karaoke and I, I shotgunned a beer for the first time. It was actually the first party I'd ever been to. Um, but anyway, uh, we were doing karaoke and God and Ronnie were up and they were doing this whole like Lady Gaga, Bradley Cooper moment. It was, it was amazing. And I don't know, I came to the realization that these people were my friends. Like they were my real friends. Ronnie, he texts me every time he sees something that reminds him of me or God, he always has dinner ready for me. And I always sit and I listen to him moaning, complaining about his football team and how they got shafted again at a match. You know, you think with like a little bit of divine intervention, this team would be good, but no, they, they still kind of suck. But, yeah, doesn't matter. <laughs> I don't know. And then I kind of had the realization that oh, I just, I haven't made friends in about 10 years. And at the risk of sounding wanky and dramatic, um, I don't know, I guess I just, saw myself as fundamentally un fundamentally unworthy of friendship. I was having all these thoughts as Roberta was sat next to me. Well, sprawled next to me. <laughs> she was like five drinks in and she was, she was half asleep. I suppose she's kind of like my friend too now. Although we kind of have a lot more of a professional relationship. <laughs> Although seeing her drooling beside me on the couch, that, that didn't feel too professional. Oh my god, you listen to me. I can't believe I'm at the stage where I actually have a hierarchy of friendships. Who am I? Anyway, I pulled into Roberta's office a few days after the party because I kindly I finally could tell her that I was ready to publish the book. And not only that, I want to publish the book under a pseudonym. Yeah. Roberta was she was pretty confused. Um <laughs> you know, after all the media and attention and stuff, I guess. I guess people know that it was me who wrote it, but I don't know, like, did I really write it? I've been thinking about it a lot. And I want to publish something that I wrote myself, me, not Maria and God, just, just Maria and the Maria who has friends and would never tell a receptionist to fuck off. I think I'm here. I hope I'm her. There was one thing I wasn't really prepared for though, that the heaven renovations would have to come to an end. I'm still not entirely sure that there are things like heaven renovations. And even so, why they have to finish just as I've had my massive moment of redemption. I don't know, it's just, it's just weird. But um, one day I came down and God was getting ready his granola and berries and he just turned and he said, you know, I, I have to go. He did make me promise not to get into any more interdimensional legal battles. I'm like, well, I said I'd try. Also, me and Ronnie went out for bowling again. And this time he brought friends and they were actually like really cool. And I found myself being nice and charming and 
I don't know, not because I like wanted something for them from them or you know, not even in a sarcastic way. I I genuinely think I was forming real connections with these people. And then we went out for pizza afterwards and Ronnie was ordering for us all. And he just turned to me and he said, you know, oh yeah, like I'll get you the vegetarian one. And I know that sounds like a really mundane story, but when he said it, I I felt quite euphoric because like I don't even remember telling him that I don't eat meat. He just knew. So Ronnie, the others and I, we finished the pizza and we were just like laughing and talking. And I was even telling stories from my childhood that I swore I would never tell. And I don't know, it was, it was great. I was great. 